Welcome to ESG in the Capital Markets, a special presentation of the CSC in partnership with MNP. Join us as we explore environmental, social, and governance strategies and their importance in the global business landscape. The push towards sustainability is resonating across all industries and sectors. Many publicly traded companies are turning to ESG to differentiate themselves among investors and consumers. But how should these strategies be implemented? And what are the most important factors to consider? We will explore ESG fundamentals for publicly traded companies and include a special focus on cannabis and mining. Where education meets opportunity, this is ESG in the Capital Markets. Welcome to ESG in the Capital Markets, brought to you by the Canadian Securities Exchange in partnership with MNP. This two-day event will look at the subject of environmental, social, and governance strategies from a macro level on day one, while we peer into specific industries like cannabis and mining on day two. Today, ESG, a journey to strategic advantage. Many publicly traded companies are turning to ESG to differentiate themselves from investors and consumers, but how best to implement these and what are the important factors to consider? ESG 101. What is it and why you should care as a public company executive, board member, and investor? Why ESG is more than a value economic driver? ESG frameworks. Choosing a framework for your organization that best supports the growth and trajectory of your business. I will now turn it over to Richard Carlton, CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange. Afterwards, we'll hear from Mark Faulkner, VP of Listings and Regulations at the CSE. Next, Mary Larson, Partner MNP. And to close it out, Edward Olson, Leader Environmental, Social, and Governance at MNP. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Richard Carlton. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Securities Exchange. We're here today to talk about ESG, environmental, social, and governance, which uh, is a very popular investment theme that's uh, moving a lot of people to uh, uh, change or look at their investment portfolio to see whether or not their investments, in fact, line up with their views about society, climate change, and other issues that uh, are gripping us all across the capital markets uh, globally, in fact, um, at the present time. So I guess there are a number of uh, uh, issues associated with, uh, with ESG, but uh, if we talk about uh, the capital market specifically, um, there's been some research uh, dating back uh, several years now that indicated that uh, not only uh, did it make uh, people feel better if they were trying to match their investment portfolios with their outlook on a variety of social issues, as I discussed, uh, whether they be environmentally related uh, or, or social change or social progress, as well as attempting to reward companies which had the most advanced uh, governance uh, uh, practices and procedures, including being significantly more reflective of the uh, societies which they come from, whether it's uh, gender diversity, racial diversity, and other um, uh, diversities that uh, we are much more aware of and talk about a lot more than, than perhaps we, we did at one point in the not too distant past. Um, but that these investments had the potential to not only make you feel better about your investments in the capital markets, but provided uh, a return which was better than that expected for a broader portfolio of uh, securities. And uh, this has been a matter of some significant debate uh, in the academic community that uh, watches the uh, performance of the uh, financial markets, uh, as well as uh, looking at uh, um, you know, the impact uh, on capital formation and cost of capital uh, for issuer companies around the world. So I guess a few basic uh, uh, points to keep in mind when we think about and, and talk about ESG in the, uh, in the capital markets. Um, the... Uh, uh, again, there is significant debate about uh, how companies should be scored uh, according to these different uh, environmental, social, and governance uh, uh, measures. 
Um, there are, in fact, competing uh, measures at this point. Many of them come from Europe, and uh, they may not necessarily score uh, companies, uh, the same companies, the same way. Um, and uh, again, there's substantial debate uh, about many of the uh, scoring systems that uh, have come into place as to whether they do, in fact, uh, properly capture uh, all of the issues uh, from uh, the ESG scorecard. Um, it's clear that this is still a developing discipline. Um, we see a lot of investment, time and energy from the index providers, for example, and companies that are involved in the classification of companies to try and provide standards so that investors uh, know that uh, they're or they can understand uh, how the companies are being scored on an ESG basis. For those of us in Canada, um, ESG can present some very specific challenges uh, because, uh, as we know, uh, the Canadian uh, market, uh, public equities, uh, a very substantial percentage of the market capitalization is derived from oil and gas uh, and uh, mining exploration and production companies. And uh, I don't think it takes uh, much understanding into the uh, uh, ESG framework to realize these companies tend not to score very well on the E part in particular. Uh, there's a view that, uh, of course, these companies are enormously uh, productive of uh, carbon and carbon-related uh, emissions, and that the environmental harm inflicted by the activities of these companies, certainly historically, um, is greater than uh, companies in many other um, fields of endeavor. And we have similar extractive industries, whether it's uh, uh, forest products, and uh, again, Canada, uh, certainly in comparison to the United States, um, the uh, uh, information technology sector, which tends to do very well uh, on uh, ESG measures, is significantly underrepresented. So the uh, challenge uh, for companies in Canada, particularly those uh, engaged in extractive industries, uh, is that they have a they have, they have a, an immense hill to climb uh, compared with uh, their peers in the broader markets in many other parts of the world, and so I think uh, companies do have to keep in mind that regardless of how they feel about uh, whether or not they're being fairly judged uh, in comparison both with their peers in the industry, as well as uh, with uh, companies uh, generally in the public capital markets, uh, that investors from around the world are going to be looking at how they project themselves, how are they telling the story that they are looking to minimize the environmental impact uh, of their activities, how they respond to uh, social issues. Uh, obviously, many of these um, companies in, in Canada uh, are operating in lands uh, uh, either uh, ceded by First Nations or unceded territories from First Nations that are subject to continuing land claims. Um, and uh, you know, again, uh, companies that uh, have a positive, productive working relationship uh, with the local First Nations uh, are going to find themselves in a better position when it comes to raising capital uh, than peers who have not necessarily considered these, uh, these issues. Similarly, from a governance perspective, uh, many of these uh, industries tend to be heavy on the engineering and geological uh, professions. And uh, historically, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, uh, we know that uh, those areas have tended to be traditional male bastions. Those barriers are breaking down, uh, but uh, clearly from a gender diversity perspective, companies that uh, take a leadership role uh, have a considerably better story to tell to the market uh, than obviously their peers in the, um, in, in the area. So this is something that, uh, as I say, is a particular challenge uh, to Canadian public companies in particular, again, because of the heavy weighting uh, of uh, those industries uh, in, the, in the Canadian, uh, the broader Canadian public uh, markets. Um, and that becomes very important uh, when um, beyond capital formation, uh, we look at uh, uh, the pressure that's being applied to insurance companies, for example, on a global scale. Again, uh, these industries require uh, significant access or access to significant uh, insurance capital to provide uh, the kind of uh, uh, guarantees that they require, um, both by 
uh, well, by form of uh, regulation, in fact. And uh, as I say, access to these services is being restricted uh, by virtue of the low ESG scores that uh, some of these companies uh, are, are receiving. So as I say, it's something that uh, uh, public companies have to keep really front of mind because, again, regardless of the validity of the approach or some of the academic challenges to the claims that were made some years ago about the positive performance of uh, of companies that score higher on the ESG scale compared with the peers in the broader market, um, that investors are looking to um, match their investments uh, with their personal beliefs and values. And increasingly, of course, folks are thinking about the environmental, social, and governance impact of the companies that uh, they are investing in. Um, and again, I think that's particularly true of the new generation of investors who have uh, joined the public equity markets, particularly since the onset of the pandemic. Um, the discount brokers have been opening uh, accounts uh, at record rates over the last uh, 16, 18 months or so. And uh, many of these uh, new account holders uh, uh, skew to a much younger demographic than historically have invested in the public equity markets in Canada. And these folks um, are very much conscious of the uh, wanting to match uh, their investment objectives um, with their social objectives uh, as well. And uh, so, as I say, companies in their investor relations uh, uh, projects and programs as they think about how to engage uh, with these new investors um, a story built around their commitment to um, uh, ESG goals uh, is something that really has to be done. And uh, it will distinguish themselves uh, from, from their peers in some cases. Or, as I say, whole industries are going to realize that in order to continue to receive public investment, um, they're going to have to commit uh, to a variety of objectives uh, which are outlined uh, under the uh, ESG framework. So, in conclusion, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of how you score companies either across industries or within a particular peer group uh, that it's done fairly and accurately. But as I say, I think this is a powerful idea. It has certainly struck a chord in the investment community. There's no doubt, and I don't have the facts and figures at hand, but it's been a very, very powerful tool for um, investment managers to open new funds and to um, um, win new investment mandates from a variety of clients uh, using ESG strategies uh, from the largest uh, investment managers in the world, like BlackRock, uh, down to uh, you know, more boutique-oriented uh, services that focus very specifically on uh, ESG as a guiding principle. So as I say, much work remains to be done, but companies really do have to understand that this is a significant and powerful theme in the investment community and something that they're going to have to focus on as they develop their investor relations uh, campaigns and their corporate funding strategies in the, uh, in the near future. I'm Mark Faulkner, Vice President of Listings and Regulation at the Canadian Securities Exchange. Richard Carlton gave us an introduction and general overview to environmental, social, and corporate governance practices as they relate to investors and investing. The experts, our friends at MNP, will go into a significantly more detail about ESG practices. I'm going to talk about our position and the role of the exchange in supporting the initiatives of our listed companies. Since its inception, CSC has believed that meaningful, relevant, and timely disclosure is paramount. There are requirements, standards, and stipulated timelines in securities law and in exchange policies, but above all, there are best practices. A public company could ostensibly be complying with all of those requirements, but still not actually meeting the disclosure objectives if they've left the investors wanting more. A company that strives to provide meaningful, relevant, and timely disclosure will generally be complying with all the requirements simply as a byproduct of those efforts. And ESG practices can be similar. There are already basic environmental, social, and corporate governance practices that are dictated by law. And there are some industry-specific regulations that will apply as well. Compliance with the law is already a requirement for listed companies, 
So how do we mandate best practices on top of that? Well, in our view, we don't. We encourage best practices. We support the issuers that demonstrate best practices. And we recognize that investors too will too when they can see the practices they're looking for reflected in the company's actions and detailed in the company's disclosure. But one of the greatest issues facing investors is the lack of any measurable standard. Richard mentioned that scoring systems are still a developing discipline. Currently, standards are inconsistent, undefined, or non-existent. An ESG-focused fund, for example, could have stated investment objectives that align with an investor's desire to do better and invest with their conscience. But how is it measured? If a company aims to be carbon neutral, for example, and erects wind farms and solar turbines in one country while simultaneously polluting in another country, would that meet the fund's objectives? Would that meet an investor's objectives if the environmental practices of a company were a significant consideration in their investment decision? The investors need the disclosure to determine that, not just a statement from the company about an objective or a statement that they're complying with a law in a specific jurisdiction. Investors need detailed disclosure to determine whether the company is meeting their own objectives and standards. So then establishing those practices for each company is not necessarily something that should be done at the exchange level, but requiring balanced disclosure is already part of basic disclosure requirements. Not all companies would or should have the same approach, even within the same industry. So the stage of business development, the laws and cultures of the jurisdictions in which a company operates or where they sell their products and services will all influence the strategy and practices of each company. When raising capital, companies will often provide volumes of analysis about the potential market for their products or services. The worldwide market for their products could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars and could be projected, even supported with proper references, could be projected to be a billion dollars within a few years of launching. Well, that's all well and good, but what is the company actually doing to tap into that market? five pages of disclosure about the market and the potential and half a page to describe the company's actual plans is probably not as balanced as it should be. So we may find that as we push for disclosure about ESG practices, companies fall into that habit of simply describing in boilerplate language and format commendable but very standard objectives without explaining exactly what the company is doing specifically to meet those objectives. In short, They'll tick all the right boxes, but spend too much time talking about why without providing or demonstrating the how, what, or when. So why then would we advocate a disclosure-based approach rather than imposing actual requirements? Because we don't believe the one-size-fits-all approach works. The board and management of the company are responsible for pursuing the business objectives of the company in the best interest of the company and its shareholders. So in addition to compliance with the laws and exchange policies, they're accountable to the shareholders for their strategy and approach to achieving those objectives. The role then of CSE and IROC as its market regulator is not to dictate best practices for each company, but rather to ensure that the disclosure by each company provides adequate detail to investors so they can determine whether the company's taking steps that align with their own objectives and standards. Should every company adopt ESG practices? Well, the obvious answer is yes, provided they're tailored specifically to each company. A food and beverage conglomerate with packaging and bottling facilities worldwide would have significant impact on the environment and culture in each country in which it operates. The practices at each facility would differ from others, but they should all support the company's overall policies. That would hardly be comparable to a junior mineral exploration company with a single project in Northern Ontario. Their objectives may be similar, but the risks and challenges, and therefore the resources and strategy will be very different. In many cases, companies that already have policies, procedures, and guidelines in place will simply be organizing and presenting the relevant disclosure in a format consistent with what investors are looking for. In keeping with the theme here, I guess it makes sense to stop talking about why 
and provide the how, what, and when from our perspective. I've touched on parts of it already. Existing disclosure policies and practices of the CSE and IROC are to review for balanced disclosure or include review for balanced disclosure. As ESG-related disclosure in periodic and timely disclosure documents expands, we will maintain our focus on that balance. But what about the standards, the inconsistent or undefined scoring systems for funds, for example? We'll soon be publishing comprehensive policy amendments that include a broad requirement with a very specific objective. Any issuer that holds out a security as being in compliance with specific non-exchange standards must disclose how compliance has been established and who was responsible for establishing that those requirements had been met. We won't be setting the standards, but consistent with our focus on disclosure, we will require that investors have the information they need and the details they need to determine whether their investment standards or objectives have been met by the companies or funds in which they invest. Thank you. Thank you, Barrington. Um, great introduction. And uh, we're really happy to be here today to talk to you in, in, this, um, in this virtual environment. My name is Mary Larson, and I am a partner at MMP. Uh, I lead the National Organizational Renewal Practice, which is basically our um, strategy, uh, scenario planning, organization design, ESG strategy practice. We also do culture transformation work. I've been in the consulting world for a very long time, 30 plus years, and have also had a number of positions in industry, have been deeply involved in sustainability for about 20 years and um, excited about the fact that we are now at a time where ESG is becoming more than just something on the fringes of the business world. So, Ed, over to you. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everybody. My name is Edward Olson. I'm a chartered accountant by trade. I lead the sustainability practice here at MMP and work very closely with Mary. I'm also a regional leader of enterprise risk services, addressing all manner of uh, topics around governance, risk, and compliance. My background around sustainability includes everything from sustainability audits to environmental management systems to carbon credits and even being responsible for the strategy operations and running of an alternative energy company. I sit on CPA Canada Sustainability Reporting Advisory Committee and I'm also a member of the Global ESG Advisory Committee with the Institute of Internal Auditors. So Mary, I'm really happy to be joining you today, today on this topic and look forward to the discussion with you. If I could, what I would like to do is quickly review with all of you who are attending what our objectives are going to be today. We want to arm you with an understanding of what is ESG. We want you to uh, walk away with being able to articulate what are the drivers that are impacting this new adoption and the, and the upswing in the whole ESG dynamic and paradigm to have a good understanding of the standards and frameworks that are globally accepted and are being implemented. And finally, what are some of those principles to keep in mind around how are we going to implement ESG? So all that being said, we're excited to bring this uh, topic to you. Great. So if we just start with, with thinking about what ESG is, I think the fundamental thing that often is is not thought of initially is uh, because people immediately go to issues of measures and and regulations and standards but in fact the first place to start is with identifying who your stakeholders are and what they care about with respect to ESG and when you do it that way then it is incredibly much easier um, in many ways to to actually get focused on on what it is that you need to do about ESG. So um, I think the, the bottom line is the issues are going to be different for literally every single organization, even organizations operating in within the same sector. So if we just took an extraction business, for example, um, if you're operating in multiple jurisdictions, then there will be multiple government bodies at various levels that you will need to pay attention to. And the same thing is true with regulators and understanding which each of those 
entities are looking for what they care about will be critical to your success. Getting in the heads of employees will also be a critical issue. I, one of my, uh, I've been reading about a company recently who um, has been paying its employees extremely well. Uh, they're, it, it's a sophisticated manufacturing uh, entity and they've got a big plant in, in North in South Carolina. Um, and unfortunately for them, um, many of their employees are literally walking down the road to other jobs perhaps not as well paying, but paying, but where they feel that the employer cares more about their physical safety. So they're marching with their feet. So employees' concerns will differ depending on the environment that you're in, um, but finding out what they care about is crucial. Customers increasingly, especially in the B2B sector, are looking at the behaviors and standards of the output of, of, their, um, of the companies that they deal with. Indigenous communities, I think, goes without saying, they're going to be looking for things like uh, responsible use of land and um, whether people from their community are being engaged or not. And of course, there might be special interest groups that will have other concerns. The bottom line is you need to think about stakeholders. And in fact, that's going to be the bulk of what we talk about today. Uh, just one last word. The financial sector, by the way, obviously is one that has gotten uh, in ahead of the game on ESG. And of course, they're placing greater pressure for, for disclosure and minimization of, of emissions um, of greenhouse gases because they are putting pressure on themselves and other people are putting pressure on them to ensure that their portfolios meet uh, self-imposed CO2, CO2 targets and, 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 and other uh, other measures. So you'll hear a lot from Ed and myself today about stakeholders. So if we go to the next page, in fact, um, when we think about the whole journey of ESG implementation, which starts with you know, defining your footprint, identifying stakeholders, this is what we're going to really focus today. We will talk uh, later in the presentation about identifying ESG topics and how you go about thinking about materiality and figuring out what it is that you're already doing, because there are a lot of things going on in many businesses these days, the data gathering and reporting and verification process. But our discussion today is really going to be focused on this issue of stakeholder identification and response. So, Ed, do you want to just talk to us a little bit about you know, what is ESG? Yeah, thanks, Mary. I think it's the perfect place to start is the basics of what is it? What are we trying to address? And, and the way we describe this is that ESG is that cluster of non-financial factors that really do have a financial impact. It's plain and simple. But getting to this solution is often more complicated than it appears. If we just look at the environmental pillar, Environmental encompasses how an organization is exposed to and manages risks and opportunities. And this is related to climate, uh, natural resource scarcity, pollution, waste management, biodiversity, and, and a host of other environmental factors. If you look at the social pillar, social considers an organization's values and business relationships, which include labor and supply chain standards, uh, employee attraction and retention, what Mary was just speaking about, employee health and safety, including product quality and safety, diversity and inclusion, and, and social acceptability of projects. There's a lot that's bundled within that S pillar. And if we move to the right and look at governance, governance incorporates information on the, the structure and diversity of the board of directors. This is also executive compensation, critical event responsiveness, Corporate resiliency, cybersecurity fits here, including things like bribery and corruption. So you can see what we provided here on screen are just some examples, but the, the ESG paradigm is quite comprehensive. So you might be sitting there wondering, how did we get to where we're at today? This is gonna be a brief overview starting in the 70s with Milton Friedman, uh, Friedman who said, shareholder primacy it's the only reason why companies exist and the immediate response from the world was no it's not just shareholders there's this idea of social contract that was proposed if we jump to 1994 
the whole emergence of triple bottom line was to take that that idea of social contract or that corporate uh, social responsibility. And what it did is it defined it further across three things. It was bottom line, it was people and planet. But the unique part is that it said each one of those three distinct responsibilities are all equal. But approaches largely remained, I would say, a marketing tool. Businesses made these gestures of what they were going to do, and in worst cases, just were doing nothing at all. And so the idea of this ESG became a new movement that came out in 2005. And where ESG differed is that it measured, uh, it was quantifiable and criteria led, and it allowed businesses to better integrate ESG into their DNA. And, and Mary's going to talk uh, a little bit further about the U United Nations Sustainable Development Goals later on in this presentation itself. So if we think about the, the what's driving ESG, why why is it suddenly why have we gone past the tipping point? There are a number of things that have that have happened, um, and we will be talking about the regulatory environment in much greater depth in the next few slides. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but um, regular uh, sustainability measures are definitely uh, very high on. Uh, regulators list of issues to, to deal with. In government, um, public policy has become a major, major issue. In Canada, we have Bill C-97 federally. Uh, we have an agreement on the need to price and control carbon emissions. We have um, basically some requirements for crown corporations to limit their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so the federal government is 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 paying a lot of attention to this. Some provincial governments are paying more attention than others. And around the world, you see the, the same thing. And this is just um, partly because voters care about this and partly because issues around climate change, DE&I, have risen to the surface. Employees, as we've seen, will, you know, can walk with their feet, the story that I, I just told you. Um, you already know about the banks. The, the pressure that has been placed since um, early, early in 2020, uh, when BlackRock, one of the big, big uh, financial institutions, talked about social responsibility, climate change, sustainability, and basically said, if you don't get on board, you're going to be left in the dust. All of that has led to a ton of responses, basically an acceleration of um, focus on the part of financial institutions to ensure that there is a link between ESG accountability and access to capital. And the cost of capital is, is, is a huge issue, especially for um, mid-sized companies. Securities commissions um, are globally driving change. And in some cases, um, uh, in a, in a way that we probably hadn't um, hadn't anticipated. And exchanges, by the way, are doing some really interesting things um, that we were quite surprised about. We did some research earlier this year, and it turns out that the United Nations has launched an initiative called the Sustainable Stock Exchanges um, Initiative, and they're tracking how exchanges are working to enhance ESG performance. Around the world, there are 108 exchanges that are tracked by the SSC. And of these, 64 are, are similar to the CSE in, in, in the sense that they're focused on small and medium sized listing programs. Within that 64, a third of them require ESG reporting as a listing rule. And more than half of them have written guidance on ESG reporting. So, this is a, an important trend. We'll see what's going to be happening with it down the road. I think with respect to customers, it's a little bit hard for many companies, especially smaller companies dealing in the B2C sector, any B2C sector to determine the degree to which its customers are uh, reacting to whether or not ESG is something that's on the on the, uh, on the on the playbook, uh, but in the B2B sector, it definitely is. So all of these entities are creating pressure on organizations to respond to ESG. And do you want to talk a little bit about getting into more of the, the detail here? 
Yeah, thanks, Mary. If I could just delve a little bit deeper into uh, accounting standard setting bodies and especially the International Organization of Securities Commissions. I said earlier that I sit on CPA Canada's Sustainability Reporting Advisory Committee. Well, just earlier this year, we had the head of the uh, International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation come to speak to us about changes that are expected and what they're pushing through IFRS around sustainability. The IFRS Foundation has their focus on COP26 in Glasgow for November of this year. And this is when they're going to outline the roadmap for the creation of a global sustainability standards board and that this board will set expectations globally for sustainability that will be, it's going to be built into the IFRS standards themselves. And of specific note, IOSCO, they put their support 100% behind the creation of this sustainability standards board. And they said that they see the urgent need for globally consistent, um, comparable and reliable sustainability disclosure standards and that these standards will truly provide the content that capital markets need. So uh, what I wanted to do here is to say, change is coming and we're actively looking towards November of this year. And what's happening I think too, is that when we think about all of these move, moving parts that are, that are taking place, one of the messages that I think is, is coming out very clearly is a discussion around, yes, we want to be setting standards and we need to be clear about what they are, but there is a lot of discussion about the fact that any reporting, any activities that a company undertakes need to be taken in the context of what it is that the, the company is all about. What are its values? What are its, you know, what are the views of its stakeholders? What are the principles that the company operates on? And so fundamentally, talking about ESG, taking action on ESG without putting it in the context of the strategy and the business operations and the, 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 the culture of the company will make people on the outside, make stakeholders far less comfortable with the quality of, of the response that an organization is taking. So we're just going to transition a little bit here into board expectations. And then, and as we keep delving into ESG, I, I wanted to refer to a quote from Ralph Speth. It keeps coming to mind because his statement of if you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. He was the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover, and he was responsible to lead the transformation of the company from this niche UK manufacturer to a global premium business. And in fact, he did lead Jaguar to become the first premium automotive manufacturer to design and engineer an all electric performance SUV. This needed foresight to see the changes that were happening globally. And of important to know, Canada will ban the sale of fuel burning new cars and light duty trucks from 2035 in an effort to reach our national net zero emissions across the country by 2050. So when you think of ESG, begin the design and implementation now. Having a strategy is going to pay dividends as compared with racing to play catch up at a future date. Transitioning, uh, the World Business Council published a report last year and they focused on the board's role in ensuring business resilience and long-term value creation. One of the highlights I was primarily interested in was this whole idea of linking value and sustainability, but, but more so was the finding that governance was actually failing. And with failing governance came value erosion. So two things were paramount here, truly understanding value and being clear as to the material sustainability issues impacting your business. Mary? Yeah, and I think there's some importance in getting out ahead of, of, of your board. So one of the things that is interesting, I mean, very powerful, is that McKinsey did a, or the Harvard Business Review recently um, reviewed, revealed the results of a uh, 
study that they did over 21 years and with about 2,000 U.S. companies in which they found that companies that improved, literally took action, not just talked about it, but improved on material ESG issues significantly outperformed their competitors. So back to the comment that that um, that Ed just made about Ralph Speth, um, this took foresight. They had to be thinking about this a long time ago to have been taking action and to show results. In dealing with your board of directors, I think it's fair to say that not all directors are going to be as up um, on all of the issues as perhaps you will be. And getting out ahead of your board of directors is not a bad idea. And one of the things that that uh, I, a recent conversation that I had with an insurance company a senior executive was, in fact, they're working on trying to identify the issues that were important to their company because the board had sort of mentioned that they were concerned about it, but didn't really necessarily know where to start. And so it's a responsibility of the senior leadership team to to exercise that foresight and to to help the board be more effective. If we go to the next page, that it's also true um, that some boards will be more proactive. And so they will be asking questions, for example, what are the adopted frameworks that are being used in your industry, in our industry? And what are the disclosure requirements that we're going to have to pay attention to if we want to access capital? Are there material risks and opportunities with respect to ESG integrated into our strategy. And again, these aren't all environmental. They could definitely have to do with the ENI or um, modern slavery or other issues. Um, are material risks sufficiently integrated into your enterprise risk management framework? And is there any assurance that you're getting over the data that you're talking about or delivering to your stakeholders. So do we do we actually believe in the numbers that we're putting out there? So those are the kinds of questions that boards should be asking. And again, if you can get out ahead of the board, that is a really powerful thing for your organization and for adding value over, over a longer period of time. If we look at the state of sustainability in Canada. I, I think it's interesting to watch and we just want to briefly take you from uh, only 2015. What's been happening in Canada? What's the approach? Mary referred to a few things already this morning around Crown Corporations, but let's let's get a little bit further into the detail. In December 2015, Canada and just about 200 other countries reached what we all know today as the Paris Agreement. And it's an ambitious agreement to fight climate change. The agreement's long-term temperature goal is to keep the rise in mean global temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels, but with the preference of getting us to be around the one and a half degree mark. So what's happened since then? Well, since December of 2015, we can just take a look here at 2016, following on the Paris, Paris Agreement, Canada outlined its own climate strategy in the document that you see here, the Pan-Canadian Framework on uh, Clean Growth and Climate Change. This strategy provided, it was an extensive description of executive um, mitigation and adaptation strategies for a clean economy that leaned very heavily and still does on carbon pricing. And if we look at what's going on now, um, or, well, very recently, June of 2019, uh, Bill C-97 was passed. And this is a, a very important um, message, I think, to business in Canada that we have rejected Milton Friedman's uh, point of view that the only reason for a corporation is to benefit shareholders. The CBCA basically codifies the need for directors and officers to consider the interests of a much broader set of stakeholders, employees, customers, pensioners, and others. And what they basically said is that these interests need to be included in strategy development and oversight, and, um, and the environment is now part of this as well. And there is more recent legislation that specifies the importance um, 
of considering other stakeholders. So this is going to only continue. Uh, bottom line is there is a focus on the long term that is being dictated uh, by our government. And then there's the CSA staff notice. Yeah, yeah and, and this is interesting, Mary, when we look at the Canadian Securities Administrators, there was a demand for better reporting on climate change risks and opportunities by by investors in the public, and, and it's been increasing over the years. So that prompted the CSA in 2017 to launch a climate change disclosure review, which resulted in the CSA staff notice 51358. What that staff notice does is it it provides reporting issuers with guidance as to how they might approach preparing um, uh, disclosures of, of material climate change related risks in the preparation of their MDNAs and their annual information forms. And it assists in identifying material climate related risks. So what's good about it is it started, but just earlier this year, the Ontario Capital Markets Modernization Task Force, they called for an absolute overhaul of Canada's largest securities regulator, with one of their requests being the need for more stringent climate-related reporting requirements in addition to what was already in the CSA staff notice. So if you are publicly listed, the influences on minimum expectations will continue to grow for the whole idea of this integrated reporting of sustainability and financial information together. Oops. Now, if, if we just change lens a little bit again and we uh, we look at all industries uh, across Canada, OSFI, who's, who's the Office of Superintendent of Financial Institutions, they're a federal regulator of banking in Canada, and their primary goal is to contribute to public confidence in the Canadian financial system. Bank of Canada is the nation's central bank and influences the whole uh, monetary policy within the country. In 2019, that was the first time ever the Bank of Canada released a report examining the threat that climate change posed to the country's financial system, which following immediately after that in 2020, Bank of Canada and OSFI announced plans for a pilot project to use climate change scenarios to better understand those risks to the financial system that is related to a, a, a transition to a low carbon economy. And if we even just look to this year in 2021, OSFI completed and published a study recognizing the risks of climate change and, and linking those risks to the potential for material implications to both assets and, and profitability. And so on the heels of that, and I think it's pretty much gotten sort of hidden in, in all of our discussions around uh, the pandemic and other issues, uh, there is now a within the budget uh, into 2021, a um, demand that crown corporations, federal crown corporations with assets over a billion dollars have to adopt the TCFD disclosure standards as part of their corporate reporting. And this basically is recognizing that TCFD is now probably a very widely accepted set of standards. And these entities are going to need to report on the degree to which they are adhering to them. So this is becoming even um, more a, 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 calm, a drumbeat uh, coming from the, uh, the Canadian government. And just to close out what's happened in, in June of this year, BC12 or Bill C12, it's also called the Canadian Net Emissions Accountability Act. And this enacted bill requires national targets for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada to be set with the objective of attaining net zero emissions by 2050, which is our, our overall national commitment. And it brings with it some more teeth for undertaking a formal reevaluation every five years. And, and the whole intent here is to drive accountability and transparency. In essence, this bill places into law Canada's commitment to reach net zero carbon emissions. So where are we today? Well, CN, Maple Leaf Foods, Celestica, Brookfield, 
BMO, all of these companies have announced new sustainability goals. I would argue that that many of them are doing this because of the pressures that are being put on them by financial services organizations and government uh, regulations and, and other pressures. Um, the point here is, and I think there was an article just in the Globe today that, that pointed out that smaller organizations are doing this kind of thing less frequently than large companies. And this has partly to do with the fact that large organizations have um, more resources to put to bear to, to actually identify where they stand with respect to sustainability and, and to determine what they're gonna do about it. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing is that, um, however, in two thirds of, of TSX companies actually do provide um, information on ESG emissions. And so they are disclosing, but um, there is going to be growing pressure on smaller organizations, mid-sized companies to do the same thing. And I think, again, that one of the things we, that Ed and I've been talking about I think consistently in this is that these sustainability goals need to be made in the context of your business with respect to your stakeholders. And by the way, we are going to be speaking more specifically about um, extraction companies and cannabis, the cannabis sector, in some subsequent discussions. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Oops, there's Enbridge too. <laughs> <laughs> So let's kick off the ESG standards and frameworks, Mary. Fun. Oh, that's my most favorite topic. That's the thing that everybody wants to know. Which standard should we be using? Because it's been alphabet soup for, for quite a while. So um, GRI is, is an interesting um, organization. It is an international independent standards organization that is in existence to help business governments and other organizations to figure out what they need to do with respect to other to reporting and to communicate their impact. So they basically are there to, to support companies, not to impose standards. Um, then there's SASB and the Integrated Reporting um, Council, which basically are, they fundamentally merged at this point. And what they're trying to do is to provide a set of standards that can be used um, by organizations when they're trying to develop uh, their reporting frameworks. And it's interesting, with SASB, for example, has over 75 industry sectors so that you can go to one of their handbooks and get a sense of, from their standpoint, which are the ESG factors that they consider to be most important. It's a, it's a good way to start. It's not, um, it's not the be all and end all, but it is an interesting way to start. The TCFD has, is talked about a lot. It is something that was created by the Financial Stability Board. And what they're basically trying to do is they're very focused on climate issues and they're developing climate related financial risk disclosures. SASB and, and integrated reporting are much broader in their scope. And then if we look at the next page, we've got the CDP and CDSB, which are there to, um, they're an international consortium of business and environmental NGOs. And they're committed to advancing and aligning global mainstream corporate reporting models. And what they basically want to do is equate natural capital with financial capital so that they're trying to really put some value on, 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 on nature, I guess is the way you put it. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but uh, it's a very interesting set of, of global goals that I think are really designed to achieve a better future for the world. And they're, they're very broad in nature, but they're also very powerful and, and in some ways moving. Um, and then the World Economic Forum is a um, set of government, environmental, social and governance metrics and disclosures uh, that are basically supporting this notion of stakeholder capitalism. And we're hearing more and more from the World Economic Forum these days. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into these ESG standards and uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And as I said, they're, they're really thought of as global goals, um, but they, they link directly 
to ESG. So they're talking about things that the world needs, you know, no poverty or hunger, health and well-being, diversity and inclusion and equity, quality education, clean energy, quality infrastructures, sustainable cities, responsible consumption, climate action, uh, taking care of life before below the water and on the land, and peace and justice. Now, you could make an argument that those are kind of pie in the sky issues, but but businesses and organizations around the world, in many cases, touch many of those um, sustainable development goals. And these are being, um, if you look at many financial institutions, many large companies, they have decided to, as much as possible, take these global goals into account as they're developing their strategies, as they're thinking about ESG. And um, they're not going to go away. They're, they're being, I think, uh, made increasingly more rich, um, at, in part because a variety of tools have been developed that enable organizations to track what they're doing, to visualize progress towards the goals that they're setting up. And um, so what's happening is they're, they're developing um, basically tools that enable companies to say, here's where I sit with respect to these sustainable development goals. And as I said, many financial institutions are adopting these. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we're trying to cover the top six for you because there are other uh, uh, global frameworks and standards. And these top six we wanted to bring to your attention. In 2020, what you see on screen, the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, they created a report entitled, and, and, and this is a mouthful, but it's it's the measuring stakeholder capitalism towards common metrics and consistent reporting of sustainable value creation. Um, let's just call it the World Economic Forum for right now. At the heart of this framework are 21 core metrics that you see on, on this slide. These are generally quantitative and, and most companies are already collecting this information. The standards also include 34 expanded metrics, which are less mainstream and have a wider value chain scope. The principles that, that designate the four pillars that you see here are governance, planet, people, and prosperity. And they're actually derived from what Mary was just talking about, the whole UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals and they facilitate integration of the standards into the mainstream periodic corporate filings of companies across all industry sectors and countries. In, in fact, the standards leverage many existing frameworks that we're gonna talk about today. And, and for instance, that's the CDSB, the GRI, SASB, Task Force on uh, Climate Related Financial Disclosures, and many others. The report intends for these stakeholder capitalism metrics to be adopted by International Business Council member companies. And ideally, the reason why it's being adopted, it, it's gonna create a domino effect of sustainability disclosure in the global marketplace with IBC member companies being the first to fall in line. So looking at this just a little bit further, the intent of this slide is to show you the link between the top line pillars of the World Economic Forum standards that are covering in the middle of the material issues in the ESG paradigm and how those link to the value reporting foundations capitals that Mary was talking about. And again, those capitals are the financial, manufactured, intellectual, human, social and relationship and uh, natural capital. Together, they represent stores of value that are the basis of an organization's value creation. And lastly, this slide shows the linkage of, of all of these into at the bottom, the UN Sustainable Development goal, uh, Goals. So the good story is there is linkage between many of the frameworks and standards. It's just not yet perfectly aligned globally. If I could just add, yeah. I just want to add one thing. One of the things that is interesting about the World Economic Forum and the UN Sustainable Development Goals is they've, They've really tried hard to develop a set of realistic targets that are tangible and described that the hope is that they'll be achieved by 2030. In some cases, it's constant improvement, but 
this stuff is not just a numbers game. It, a lot of, you know, a lot of hard thought has been put into well, what would this really look like? And I think that it makes for some interesting, interesting reading and thinking. Yeah, great point, Mary. Thank you. Changing standards into the GRI, Mary was talking about earlier, this actually goes all the way back to being created in 1997. And it's, it's, it was the first and is considered one of the most widely used frameworks. Its objectives are to provide companies with sustainability standard metrics so they can show their responsible environmental practices. And the, the GRI standards, they detail approaches to materiality, to management reporting and disclosure for a, a comprehensive range of sustainability issues. And their, their metrics actually have evolved over the years to now be expanded and include human rights, governance, and social well-being. The modular interrelated GRI standards, they're designed primarily to be used as a set to prepare a sustainability report focused on material topics. So saying that, there are three universal standards, the 101, 102, and 103 that are used by every organization that reports under the GRI framework. So everybody reports using 101, 102, 103. An organization also chooses then from the topic specific standards to report on its material, economic, environmental, and social topics, which are further detailed in GRI 200, 300, and 400. So if we just choose one social topic from the 400 standard, we can pick out GRI 411, and it's entitled the rights of indigenous peoples. And it addresses the whole aspect of how well does your organization state the total number of identified incidents uh, of violations involving the rights of indigenous peoples. And it gets into the whole process of, was it reviewed the incident by your organization? Are there remedi remediation plans in place? Are the results being monitored to change internal management processes? So it's really unique that it can get to that level of granularity, but this is the high level overview. In June of 2021, uh, Mary also referred to this, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and the International Integrated Reporting Council, they announced their merger and now they're referred to as the Value Reporting Foundation. And you can see on this slide between these two uh, comparative pictures, there is alignment of the IR's capitals that uh, we've spoken about earlier and actually SASB sustainability dimensions. The VRF, it's an ESG guidance framework that sets standards for the disclosure of financially material sustainability information by companies to their investors. The resources they provide include the integrated uh, thinking principles, the integrated reporting framework, the SASB standards. And Mary, you, you referred to this a little bit earlier. Those SASB standards track ESG issues and performance across 77 industries. And, and I, I'm, I'm very fascinated. This whole framework is built to support companies in sharing their outward ESG impacts through the language of investors, debt holders, and internal financial stakeholders. If we move into the climate, the, the TCFD, the climate change, it's a realization that it, prevent, it presents financial risk to the global economy and, and financial markets need clear, comprehensive, high quality information on the impacts of climate change. This includes the risks and opportunities presented by rising temperatures, climate related policy, emerging technologies in our world. TCFD, uh, well actually the Financial St uh, Stability, Stability Board, pardon me, created the TCFD in 2015 and that whole intent was to increase reporting around climate related financial information. And it helps organizations across the globe articulate how ESG performance is most likely to material impact future financial performance and value creation. So as the Earth's temperature rises, increasingly common natural disasters are, are disrupting ecosystems and human health causing unanticipated business losses and threatening assets and infrastructure. This response 
governments and private sector entities are considering this whole range of options for reducing global emissions, which could result in disruptive change across economic sectors and regions in the near and long term. So how does the TCFD work? Well, it's broken into the four pillars that you see here around metrics and targets and risk management strategy and governance. This guidance identifies multiple climate related risks and opportunities to disclose. And to give you a bit of an idea, we've just thrown on screen. Here's two questions out of many. Does your company describe the board's or a board committee's oversight of climate related risks or opportunities? If your answer is no, there's a lot of work to be done. So there's just guidance here that gives you some context around things that they would expect uh, to see within your organization. The Carbon Disclosure Project, it was actually formally known as Carbon Disclosure Project and now it's referred to as CDP. And the Carbon Disclosure Standards Board, they offer a complete system for climate disclosure and, and elements of environmental and natural capital disclosure. So companies and investors, they can disclose climate change and elements of environmental information through the CDP platform and that provides the structure for data collection and the content for reporting. So in essence, CDP manages a global environmental disclosure system used by more than 8,400 companies. And in fact, they do claim to hold the world's most comprehensive collection of self-reported environmental data. Well, companies disclose by completing any or all of three CDP questionnaires. And the questionnaires include general and, and sector specific questions aimed at high impact sectors. The scoring of those questionnaires, while it's conducted by accredited scoring partners who are trained by the CDP. And it's important to know that reporting is actually completed on an annual basis. The challenge is that the CDP has an 88 page document with over 200 questions so gathering the required data and responding to the CDP questionnaire, it's no small undertaking. So in summary, the CDSB framework has seven primary guiding principles and 12 reporting re requirements, but it gives you a little idea of the detail. So Mary, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, and, and so we're going to go right back to this question about stakeholders because there are lots of ways for an organization to decide what kind of sustainability framework they ought to be using and how they should be going about reporting. And just to build on what Ed just said, CDP is very appropriate for a company, perhaps in the oil and gas sector, um, where greenhouse gas emissions uh, or in some aspects of agriculture, for example, where greenhouse gas emissions are going to be very, very important and where investors, buyers, and other stakeholders are going to be paying a lot of attention to this. Um, SASB is, is something the investment world is looking at. It's kind of what the default for the investor, investor world is SASB reporting. Um, it's straightforward. It's, it's prescriptive. It covers all of the ESG factors. Um, TCFD, again, is more focused on environmental and, and governance uh, uh, issues. And GRI, GRI is perhaps the most well-balanced one. Um, but depending on who your stakeholders are, what you want to accomplish and what you want to disclose and, and work on, um, there's their choices to be made fundamentally. So hopefully here, Mary, they're starting to talk the same language or work together. Can you address that? Yes, and um, I think that the one of the things that's going on with the corporate um, uh, reporting dialogue is that the dialogue is 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 there basically to um, set up communications around the direction, content, and ongoing developments of all the stuff that we've just been talking about. So reporting frameworks, standards, and related requirements. It's been a little bit like the Wild West for the past couple of years. And um, I think we've just talked through a lot of aspects and, 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 and dimensions. And if you're not confused, then you're a genius. Um, and this organization or this dialogue is trying to, to make some, some sense out of it. 
Um, what they're trying to do is identify practical ways and means by which the respective framework standards and related requirements can be explained and aligned. And what they're trying to do as well is avoid conflict, inconsistency, and duplication between them and get a common voice on, on what, uh, what really needs to be talked about on areas of mutual interest where as possible and to get all of the parties around the table, including regulators, so some sense could be made on this. Um, the, the participants are pretty broad based and um, there's a lot of experience around the table. And, and I'm not sure when, the, when that, um, the output of that is going to be. Do you, do you know it's when that- It's an evolution right now, and I think we're gonna have ebbs and dribbles coming out, but COP26 in November is gonna be a big defining moment of who's on board with sustainability, who isn't, and what is gonna be the global participation moving forward through a global approach to sustainability. So we're, we're laser focused on November to see what comes from that. Right, okay, good. And what has happened, I think, is, is with all this focus on, on standards and reporting, uh, what we believe at MNP is that companies and senior leadership need to step back and say, okay, there is a journey here. We need to start on this journey. We need to start fairly quickly. And there are principles around operations. So a compliance focus through sustainability, making that a core part of the culture, um, at least starting to talk to your stakeholders so that and building to ongoing engagement so that there is a, a constant dialogue going on is with respect to what you're doing about ESG issues. Um, governance at the beginning, there's minimal discussion about these issues, but growing into far more sophisticated uh, approaches on the part of, part of the board and, and management to address ESG, integrating strategy, uh, ESG into your strategy. And at the beginning, um, limited reporting through all the way through to integrated reporting and and even um, uh, the the whole issue of making sure that your uh, measures are in some place same way shape or form audited. So um, those are just some things to think about that this does these issues cut across operations stakeholders governance strategy and reporting. It's not just a reporting issue. And I think over to you. Uh, no, back to me. Sorry, still me. Sorry. I'm. I'm. Um, what I, I alluded this to this a little bit earlier that there is this journey, and uh, the last slide just talked about that, which is that you start. You got to start somewhere, and it is not necessary for every organization to get to the the ultimate um, goal of level four that we talked about in the in the maturity model that that we the kind of highlight of that that we just showed in the last slide. Um, what we see as the whole journey being is, is a pretty interesting um, one and it can take a little bit of time, but increasingly I think people are, are developing a set of urgency around this, which is the first thing is to understand what, what, is, your, what is your footprint? And this is, you know, where does the business operate? What is the extent of our scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, just for example? and how do our products and services uh, affect sustainability. Then there's this whole issue of identifying stakeholders, figuring out what they care about, what's gonna be important to them, and very importantly, figuring out which ESG topics are going to be financially material to your organization because they're important to your stakeholders, whether internally or externally. Assessing the materiality of these so that you're focused on the ones that make the most difference, building a sense of what is already being done. And I think in many cases, organizations are surprised sometimes at the things that are already being done. Um, for example, safe, safety statistics may already be being gathered and reported on. Um, DE&I initiatives may have already started in your organization. So um, inside your business, what are you doing? What are you not doing? And, and then basically gathering data from other companies, what are they doing, what are the implications for your own business, and developing a strategic management approach and the governance systems to, to enable you to not just talk about ESG, but to actually tackle, make progress, demonstrate the progress that you're making and, um, and ensure 
all the stakeholders that the right things are being done. And then finally, this notion of reporting and verification. So those are all the steps that are required to, to, to accomplish ESG. And yes, I know it's daunting. Um, Ed, do you want to talk a little bit about this uh, business footprint issue? Because it's fascinating. Yeah, and, and Mary, what we're going to do is of those seven steps, we're just going to do a little dip below the surface to give everybody here an idea. When we talk about the whole idea before any ESG topics can be identified, it's so important to understand and conduct what we call this baseline assessment. And really what we're doing is we're just mapping out what's your organization's operational footprint. It's, it's a way to know what you do where you do it, including the products and services that you offer. And in essence, it's like outlining the field for a football game. It's hard to play the game of ESG if you don't know where the field is. It also helps to know where your responsibility extends as we embrace the whole idea of, of the many uh, ESG and sustainability topics and laser focus on those that are most material. So that's, that's business footprint and understanding boundaries. How about stakeholders again? Well, the stakeholders, I think I went on uh, fairly extensively at the beginning, but it's, you know, it's takes taking stock of all of these stakeholders, um, engaging in initial conversations with all of them to ensure that you're clear about what expectations are uh, and that, you know, there, there's no point running off madly in all directions on issues that people don't care about or that entities don't care about or that they're not tracking. Um, but it, it is critical to get these conversations going quickly and to make sure that these conversations are being done in a way that is disciplined and, and comprehensive so that things aren't being missed. And identifying those topics, Mary, I mean, there seems to be a lot yeah. out there. What do we do? What do we do? So um, what one of the things that we do is, uh, depending on the, the level of concern on the part of different stakeholders, is digging into figuring out which um, of the, the topics that you need to focus on, which reporting standards you need to think about, and, um, and, and basically making sure that you're not missing anything. Um, I did want to mention on the lower right hand side here, what you see is this notion I was talking about um, with respect to stakeholder conversations. Direct interviews are fine, with some cases surveys are, are fine. Uh, working group discussions, focus groups, public information assessment and requests for comment. There are lots of ways to engage with stakeholders and, and the, the way to engage with the stakeholders will differ. Um, by the type of stakeholder, by the type of information that you're gathering, and and doing a good job of this at the beginning is is will stand you in good stead. And we've got an example here of um, SASB is just a, a way to start sometimes with our clients. It is a good way to start. Um, you're in the healthcare delivery sector. What are the things that people care about if you're in another sector? You know, getting a good start on that could be a way um, to to drive your stakeholder. Um, discussions at the very outset. So once you get and what we're trying to do is create this big funnel taking all ESG topics and, and materiality now becomes important because you can't deal with everything at once. So you're trying to understand well which are material and materiality for ESG is like financial materiality. Both are focused on information that would change the minds of stakeholders using that information. But the approach is two dimensional here for ESG and not strictly quantitative. On the one side, the degree to which ESG topics will have a, a bearing on the success of your organization's products, people and services. And the other is the importance of these ESG topics to stakeholders. The power of mapping the topics on this grid, this approach. If you know the idea of a picture says a thousand words, well now you can see which topics are most important to you that significance of the top right is where you want to start now creating an ESG strategy to address each of those topics and address them meaningfully. And this right. is, oops, sorry. And this is the whole point about figuring out what you're, you're doing already. 
Um, in terms of health and safety, I mentioned earlier that you may already be gathering statistics. You may be have undertaken uh, initiatives. That, uh, very likely that health and safety is is something that's further along than it might otherwise be. Um, indigenous issues. Um, what kinds of initiatives are you undertaking with respect to communities um, with whom you you are involved? And in the topic of communities, I think um, historically what's happened is that organizations have, have relied on donations, volunteering, and that sort of thing. Um, but I think in here also is the whole issue of DE&I. And donations, volunteering, but taking this a step further to be really truly a part of communities, I think is more what people are looking for these days. Uh, the environment, we've spent a lot of time talking about this, but this is deciding on the standards, um, deciding what you're going to be doing with respect to resource consumption and, and employee behaviors and uh, employees. So de and I is a, is a big uh, aspect here or developing a, a workforce strategy in and of itself, um, developing an employee brand. Um, so taking stock is a really good idea because you may find yourself further along than you otherwise might have thought you were. It, looking at the whole idea of data management and governance systems, ultimately your organization will need to be setting targets, measuring performance against those topics and reporting to external stakeholders. This means your underlying management systems your control environment and data integrity is absolutely essential. And with stakeholders like investors relying on this publicly disclosed information, reputation and attraction of capital is going to be key. The emphasis on high quality, verifiable and consistent data will become increasingly important and really should be a critical part of your ESG strategy for building out your business model. And this and is the last step. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's your step, I think, because you're the reporting and verification. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, we end up at reporting and verification. This is where you get to tell the good news story. What have we done? If we have communicated targets, how well are we achieving against those targets? Where should we be moving forward where we're not quite hitting the targets we'd expected? Reporting is one part, but there's going to be a growing movement, and we're seeing it already today, that just like your financial statements will be audited, your sustainability information will also need to be verified so that the users like investors and financial institutions can actually rely on it to make decisions about the long-term sustainability of your organization. Right. How can so, we help, Mary? <laughs> or how we can help. Um, basically, uh, MNP, and you can tell that, that Ed and I are both quite passionate about this, but we, um, as a firm, can, can work with uh, organizations to help them along this journey. And so, uh, first of all, there's this notion of moving from the baseline to maturity, and it is this, this idea of of strategically and and consistently in an organized discipline manner, thinking through, you know, your initial assessment, um, where you are in the maturity uh, continuum, and defining your desired state of maturity, and then developing a business case for ESG adoption and maturity, and and so this is more of a strategic look at at ESG, and also involves potentially training boards and management. Uh, we do spend a lot of our time um, in, with stakeholder assessments, identifying the, the stakeholders, conducting stakeholder consolidation, and compiling uh, inventories of topics uh, for input, and then also developing uh, stakeholder engagement frameworks over the long run. Uh, the impact side of things is to actually inventory ESG topics, conduct materiality assessments, uh, linking ESG topics specifically to corporate value and your strategic priorities and uh, doing competitive benchmarking to ensure that the targets that are being set and the ways that you're going about measuring um, ESG factors is uh, the ways are, are, are up to uh, our, our best, best practice. 
um, frameworks, we can help our clients select the, the relevant and most appropriate ESG frameworks and assist in setting targets and evaluating the data integrity for each of these topics. Uh, and reporting, we have helped our clients with designing report uh, formats, templates, um, developing integrated reporting approach, approaches and ensuring that the quality, quantity and, and quality of the information is correct. And then finally, there's the whole verification. So third party verifications, assurance of ESG reporting and testing and validation of the management systems. So is the not so much um, um, the data itself, but are the management systems themselves that are just that are generating the information um, integrated and appropriate. So pretty much along the continuum are things that that we can do to help our clients in this in this area. So where does that leave us? This is where we're going to have to wrap up. I would say we've hit the group with a lot to digest, Mary. There's a lot in terms of the frameworks and the standards, a lot in terms of the approach. What we want to do next out of this is we're going to do that deeper dive into some of the issues and topics around the cannabis and the extractive industries. What should we be uh, looking at? How do we want to approach? What are some of the commonly disclosed topics? We're going to deal with that and have two separate sessions. I would say today, if you could take that internal look and ask yourself, where does my company sit on adopting sustainability? If we look at that idea of maturity, how mature would we be? And if we know we need help, get help. That is the fundamental is this isn't something that's going to be going away. It is fundamentally transforming how businesses operate today, including all the drivers that Mary talked about at the beginning of this. So thank you. This has been informative, I hope, for everybody. And uh, we remain committed to answering any questions that come from it. If there's anything else, uh, otherwise we'll see you in the individual presentations that will be following up to this general session. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Canadian Securities Exchange, I'd like to thank you for joining us for ESG in the Capital Markets. And specifically, I'd like to thank Richard Carlton, Mark Faulkner, Mary Larson, and Edward Olson for their insights, for their time, their expertise, and their knowledge on the subject of ESG. Please make sure to join us tomorrow for a specific presentation on ESG in cannabis and ESG with regards to mining. I've been your host, Barrington Miller. If you like this content and others, please make sure to click subscribe or like on the various social media platforms. Thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next episode.